Hi, everyone. I'm Shakia Taylor. I'm a sports writer with the Chicago Tribune. And this is <laughs> Sabres Ballpark Day News, um, where every month I talk to an interesting figure in baseball. This month, we have <clears throat> Meg Rowley. She is the managing editor of Fangraphs and co-host of the Effectively Wild podcast. Previously, she served as managing editor of the Hardball Times and wrote for Baseball Perspectives, where she won the 2017 Saber Analytics Conference Research Award for Contemporary Baseball Commentary. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Bryn Mawr College and a master's degree in political science from the University of Wisconsin. Hi, Meg. Hi, how's it going? Very well. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, I always tell people like, oh, Meg's one of my faves. Oh, so welcome. Um, <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I saw that you were at the World Series and this was your yes. first time covering the World Series. So how are you? How are you feeling? And how was it? <laughs> Um, it was wonderful. I am very tired, um, but in a, a really nice way. It's just like a very cool thing to have gotten to do. Um, every now and again, I have to remind myself that, you know, like every job has job stuff. You're tired, you're cranky, you have a big project to do. But every now and again, my job involves going to the World Series and getting to see Chase Field react to this Diamondbacks team. And try to think about how to communicate what I saw, which I'm still working on. So it was, it was very, very cool. It was unlike any baseball thing I've ever gotten to do. So I'm, I'm excited. It is shining through how tired I am. <laughs> <laughs> I know that in the moment, you know, you all are aware that you're experiencing history because it's been talked about over and over again, but like, were you in the moment like, damn, this is a moment or were you, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. That? Yeah, it's funny. Like, you know, I think that most of the other people who had been, uh, who were in the press box said, you know, they'd done one of these before. They had experienced that. And there's a, a calm that kind of settles over them as they get ready to do the part of like, okay, how am I going to approach, you know, talking about this game, analyzing this game. Um, but I think particularly game five, where the Rangers won, you know, before they won, Zach Gallen was throwing a perfect game and then a no hitter. And, you know, I was texting with other media members there. I was out in the ox box for that game. I was like, are we going to watch a world series? No hitter. It was so tense in there. You know, the fans were just dying to explode for something good to happen for the diamondbacks. And at one point I was, I was so wrapped up in it and so nervous that I actually checked MLB game day to see like, what is, what is the conclusion of this plate appearance? And then I was like, then when you're at the ballpark, like you're going to know before the computer does. <laughs> so I, I really did feel kind of swept up in the moment for, for stretches of it. And then you start to think about, you know, what are the interesting narratives from this? What are the managers doing? How do I think about their decision-making? You know, who are the, the guys in this game who've really made a difference? And, you know, we got to see the Rangers win their first world series as a franchise. And, um, you could tell that, especially for the folks who had been with the team for a long time, you know, they have nightmares of David Freeze like running through their head, right? And so to be able to sort of expiate that feeling and and finally lift the trophy was, I think, very cool for them. And it was really cool to see. What were some of the things about this World Series that surprised you? <clears throat> I think that, you know, you can start with the Diamondbacks being there at all. Um, you know, both of these teams entered uh, as wild card contenders, but the D-backs were the the weakest team in the playoff field, not just in the National League. Um, they only won 84 games. They had a negative run differential. And I live in Arizona, so they're the big league team that I see in person the most often. And, you know, they've got, they went through stretches this year where they looked really great, where their starting pitching was very strong, their offense was scoring a bunch. And then, you know, their, their bullpen was pretty weak all season. We saw that at at points in the in the postseason, but I think just their presence um, it kind of unsettled a lot of people. I think that even though we know that 162 games is what really tells you who the best team in baseball is, we still want to ascribe all this meaning to the World Series and the postseason, even though it's it's so random. You're just subject to the vagaries of chance um, so often, and who who's available to start for you in any given night. And so I think that um, they really drove home, like 
that anything can happen in a seven game series. And sometimes that means you knock off the Phillies and advance. And sometimes that means you're watching somebody else, you know, celebrate on your field after the fact. So it can be, you know, that sort of tug between this team that, um, you know, had defied expectation all along the way and does have talented players, but isn't quite cooked yet. Right. And you could say the same thing about the Rangers, but they're further along in their process. You know, when you're at the point that you're signing Corey Seager and Marcus Semyon and you're bringing in Jacob deGrom and then he gets hurt and it's like, fine, we'll go get Scherzer. Like, you know, screw it. Let's, let's try to win this thing. I think you're, um, you're dealing with two franchises that are sort of at different stages of their, um, their progress toward being real contenders. But I think, you know, the surprises along the way were really what kind of drove home for me, just how random October can be. Uh, and, and how, you know, I've only, I grew up a Mariners fan. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with my favorite baseball team being in the postseason. Don't know if you've heard, uh, not a thing that we do in Seattle very often, but last year when the Mariners were in the postseason, I remember saying to someone, I was like, this is torture. Like how do how do Dodger fans do this every year? I would just be, you know, by the end of October, I'd be a wreck. So Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a marathon for the fans too. (laughs) Um, You mentioned something that uh, was really funny to me last night when you were talking about watching another team celebrate on your field. They protected the pool. um, They protected the pool. (laughs) So that there could be no celebration (laughs) happening in the pool. Did you see that? What did you think of that? I saw it and the thing that was funny was how how long they protected the pool right so they they did the you know they did the ceremony and you know they hand the commissioner's trophy off and they named Corey Seager MVP and then all of those guys went into the visiting clubhouse to spray champagne and bud light on each other as an aside that combination of smells is Overful. It is one of the worst things I've ever smelled. You can practically see that smell. It's so strong. It is just in every pore and surface of you by the time you get out of there. But they put like a an army of, of security guards there outside of the pool and then in the pool itself. And they stayed there while people are like writing in the box, trying to file on deadline. Like they were there for hours after the fact and eventually most of them kind of filed off and they left I think two guys out there but I did wonder I was like what is the plan are you going to tackle Max Scherzer if he tries to get in the pool <laughs> like what are we doing and I know that there have been times in the Diamondbacks history where other people celebrating in the pool has been a real bone of contention but um they it was pretty funny to see all these guys you know they're ready to go I'm like what are you gonna do you're not gonna throw Evan Carter over your shoulder and cart him (laughs) off the field like he's some fan who got drunk and got on the field during the game like what are we doing here (laughs) right okay we gotta get to the real important stuff what snacks do you did you take with you for the games that you went to because I follow Lindsay Adler and yes and they both are, they're snackers. Like I saw some yeah. peanut butter and chocolate trail mix and some Celsius. And what are you taking? What did you take? So uh, across from Chase Field, there is a Bosa Donuts, uh, which is like our uh, donut chain here in the Valley. Um, they have excellent breakfast sandwiches. So even though I was getting to the park around noon most days, I would get a sausage, egg, and cheese on a croissant and a big 24-ounce iced coffee. And uh, the gals in there are great. And I was there enough that they were like, do you need a nice coffee today? And I was like, yes, I do. Thank you very much. So that's what I started with. I did press dining. And then I would like, you know, I, I had some Halloween candy I brought with me because you know, what are the trick-or-treaters going to get it all when I'm at the ballpark on Halloween? No, I'm going to have a little bit too. Um, but I I tend to not be a snacker um, mid-game because I don't like to like have my fingers sticky and I'm trying to type and do stuff and make a mess. So I tend to uh, lean on the side of, of having a meal, um, making sure it has protein, and then alternating coffee and water uh, so that I am at least somewhat hydrated by the time things are done. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, people who are on the road more than I am have, they have a routine, you know, they know 
the beats of the trip for them to set themselves up for success. So yeah, sometimes people come in with like huge bags and <laughs> Phoenix is an underrated food city. So there actually are some good options downtown if you're like trying to not just do the press dining, which is a fine option. They had cakes for like every single game, like giant sheet cakes in, in the press dining area. Um, and at one point <laughs> during the championship series, you know, they they were giving out um, reusable water bottles so that people hopefully weren't using as many paper cups and they set them up where the cake goes. And I could hear discussion going on, like, does the cake lady know that these water bottles are here? Like they were very concerned about upsetting the cake lady made giant sheet cakes for everybody. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's Everybody, I'm in, I'm in awe of Beats because they have to have a routine down and really know what they're doing. And, you know, they have methods for snacks and luggage and hydration on the road and what they wear on the plane to be comfortable. And it's a whole thing. But since since it was local, I didn't have to worry about that quite as much. So. <laughs> I've actually gone shopping with Disha as she was purchasing things for being on the road and there is a sure. whole like strategy you know you yes. gotta commit to color or no color or certain colors yeah and, yeah, yeah I didn't know it was the whole thing but I did see everyone being very happy on their flights home today yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah um, so to pivot to fan grabs for a second um how long have you been managing editor at fan grabs yeah and what's that like so I I started as the managing editor of the Hardball Times, which was our long form vertical, which sadly did not survive the pandemic. Um, but when Carson Sestouli, who was the managing editor after Dave Cameron, uh, left to go be uh, a scout for the Blue Jays, I got promoted. And that was in November of 2018. Um, so I feel like I've had two normal years at Fangraphs. And the first normal year, I was still like figuring out how the phones work as it were. You know, when you're just getting your feet under you in that kind of job, you're you're trying to figure out the beats of the, the baseball calendar. And, you know, it's not until you're really in the second year where you start thinking, okay, I've, I've sort of given some editorial direction to this publication. I know what I'm doing. I know what big sort of annual projects I have. What do I want to do to sort of mold the site in ways that I think are, you know, going to be interesting for readers and good for our staff. And I got like two, three months of that. And then the pandemic <laughs> and everything got turned on its head. And, you know, we were pretty fortunate to survive that because you no know, baseball meant very few people reading the site and ad rates were just terrible for everyone during 2020. So that, that year was, I mean, obviously very hard for a lot of people and, you know, we felt fortunate just to be kind of chugging along, but that was a, a tricky year. And then the next year we have a, a kind of normal season and then we have the lockout. So this was the first sort of post pandemic year that was normal uh, for me, but it's, it's been really great. I mean, I think that it's always uh, challenging when you're coming into a leadership role on a site that's been along around for as long as Fangraphs has. You know, mm -hmm. there's a really rich tradition at the site. There are a lot of people who have passed through the site who work for teams now. You know, we had a number of people, alums, who were sort of in the postseason this year, um, and you know, we're hoping to be the the first one to like bring a ring home to Fangraphs. Um, and so, you know, for me, it was trying to balance, sort of respecting the the parts of the site that are our bread and butter and that we're known for while also finding ways that we can continue to sort of adapt to what the baseball landscape looks like now. You know, I think that if you were to go back to Fangraphs when it was first founded, it was sort of very nuts and bolts analytics. Mm -hmm. You know, people were still trying to pull apart the puzzle box and figure out how to optimize teams and be the most efficient. And I think that Base, public baseball rating has evolved a lot in the last 10 years where I think we are aware of the impacts that that has not only on how enjoyable the game is to watch, but the people who play it and work in front offices and have to earn a living um, playing baseball or trying to. Uh, and I think that that's been to the industry's benefit because we're able to 
sort of approach the game more humanely, even as we're still trying to understand like how to crack the puzzle that is baseball. Um, and so finding the balance between those things and, you know, helping our writers to engage with, you know, what does baseball really look like in 2023? How do we think about rule changes? How do we think about the lockout? You know, I imagine that if if the lockout had happened in sort of the Saber 1.0 generation, the coverage would look really, really different, not just at Fangraphs, but everywhere mm-hmm. compared to how it looks now. I think that we're, um, we're much better as an industry at sort of recognizing how the, you know, sort of the power dynamic between ownership and players and being more skeptical of what ownership mm-hmm. is claiming about what they can do and what they can afford. And so, you know, trying to think about how we we marry those um, bigger sort of industry forces and covering those with, you know, here's here's a reliever you've never heard of. You know, <laughs> here's here's what's going on with this pitcher you like spin rate. Here's the swing adjustment that this prospect just made. You know, trying to make sure that there's something for everyone um, and giving our writers the latitude to sort of explore what's interesting to them. So. There's there's a lot that's that's gone into that. And I think that, you know, our staff is really, really strong. And I work with people who know the game really well and also have good editorial judgment. So it makes that process easier. But um, it's, you know, it's nice to I, I, I don't want to jinx things. It's like nice to be in a period of relative calm within baseball, at least. Um, yeah, it's probably not uh, certain to last, but this did feel like the first sort of normal season. And even within that Mm -hmm. normal season, we had like the biggest rule changes that the sport has experienced in like 50 years. So, you know, what is normal really? (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, since you, you, you bring up the rule changes, that was absolutely going to be one of my questions is how do you feel now having experienced the full season of the change? Did, did you, were you able to, to feel an impact uh, the way you thought was different? Oh yeah, I, you know, I, um, <laughs> I'm not in the habit of um, praising the commissioner because I, I certainly have a couple of notes if, if uh, Manfred is interested in them, but I will say that I think that the pitch clock was a resounding success. Um, I think that the improvement it had, not just on time of game, which, you know, I'm a baseball sicko, so that was a little less important to me, but just the pace of the action, I think, is appreciably better than it was uh, in prior seasons. And, you know, when you combine that with how much more speed and energy there is in the game with all of the base stealing that we've seen, I think it was a, a pretty positive change. And I think, you know, the the best compliment I can pay it is that um, you know, I'd seen the pitch clock in action in the minor leagues. I'd seen it in action in the Arizona Fall League. Um, but after the first couple of weeks, once announcers, I think, felt confident that fans understood the rules and sort of had a, a feel for the mechanics of it, I forgot it was there most of the time. You know, yeah. it, it, mm-hmm. there weren't a lot of violations. The game had, you know, good pace. It felt zippy, but you know, the only times I've ever really felt this year a little bit rushed is actually in the ballpark. Um, when you're, especially if you're there, you know, if I'm just going in on a, on a ticket to like take in a game with friends, you know, with the pitch clock, if you're not careful, you go to get a beer and, you know, you might miss two innings, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. they're moving along so quickly. So I think that, you know, when you're in, in the ballpark, it can feel a little bit different, but watching on TV, um, I, I think it's really worked out well. And it's so, you know, it's so much fun to see guys like Acuna and Corbin Carroll just like running amok on the base paths. It, yeah. it just brings an energy to the game that I think m- makes a really big difference in terms of how it feels to watch baseball. And, you know, people I know who aren't big baseball fans have checked stuff out this year. They've kind of been a little more engaged because they're like, well, you know, yeah, I'm going to watch Ronald Acuna Jr. steal 70 bases. Okay, I'll, I'll tune in for that. So I think it's really been to the game's benefit. This was uh, one of the first seasons where some of my friends who definitely do not pay attention would send me pictures of players and say, who's this? And then I so great. I'd jump in like, oh my God, so let me tell you all about him. 
you know, yeah. you know his name and where he's from. And so I, I do think despite all of the chatter in the last you know couple of days about interest in baseball and viewership numbers and which I think is like a non-issue for fans, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I do think that there is going to be some new people despite all yeah. of that. Um, yeah. Which, you know, I thought the playoffs were super fun. I thought they were super fun. Um, I, I mean, anytime I'm, so I haven't been covering baseball as much as I might want to. And, you know, yeah. in my job with the trip, which, you know, I'm having a great time, by the way, y'all. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's been like, I will plan my day. Like, okay, I got to stop working yeah. at this time so that I can lock in on the games. And as we got deeper, you know, into the postseason, yeah. my day started, I'd be like, okay, can I, can I log out at four? Can I, can I, <laughs> <laughs> like, I gotta, yeah. I gotta be done. So, um, the excitement went, I feel, throughout, right? When you say yeah. throughout the postseason? I think that especially as we got into the later rounds and the series started to get longer, you know, in the early going, because all of those wild card series ended after two games, there was that weird kind of gap that we had. Yeah. But I think, you know, more than anything, we just had some new faces this year. You know, this was the first World Series in six seasons that hasn't featured either the Dodgers or the Astros. And I'm sure that Dodgers and Astros fans are disappointed by that because they want to watch their favorite team. But I think it's good for the sport to have, you know, new faces and teams that haven't been there quite as much. Um, you know, there's there was a mix of standbys and strong clubs, but I think it's good for the sport for there to be you know, new sort of new energy and for their, t you know, new heroes and villains to emerge. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't mean it as a disrespect to either of those clubs, but I was like, enough with the Dodgers already. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of this. I would have rather Clayton Kershaw not go out in quite such devastating fashion. But, um, but other than that, you know, it was, um, I think it was exciting to have some new, some new blood. You know, when the NL rookie, presumptive NL rookie of the year, is playing in the World Series on a club that a lot of people don't watch. And so they're kind of getting to know him for the first time. Mm -hmm. Like, that's pretty cool. So. Um, Kershaw, I, mm -hmm. um, I rarely dip my toe into um, Twitter fights. I usually am in, I love mess. I'm going to watch the mess. I will not participate yeah. <laughs> in the mess. However, I was deeply offended by the disrespect that was given to Clayton Kershaw. And I ended up like posting numbers from some really good Kershaw performances yeah. to kind of ask the question, like, how does this fit your narrative? How does this fit the narrative that Kershaw chokes and Kershaw is not built for this? And what do you think Clayton Kershaw's legacy is or will be? Just as of right now, let's say he never plays again after today. I think, I mean, like he is to my mind, a, a no doubt hall of famer. He's one of the best pitchers of his generation. I think that part of why his relative struggle in the postseason, and you're right, it hasn't been every playoffs he's had, he's had some sparkling starts uh, in the postseason, and he's had some important relief appearances for the Dodgers too. Um, but I think that part of why his, struggles quote unquote in the postseason stand out is because they are they are in contrast to just how incredible he has been in the regular season throughout the course of his career and I think that people you know it's easy for us to forget the details of a of a guy's season right sometimes he's just he just hasn't had it right like that has right. happened for Kershaw in the postseason but you know this year in particular like he was so clearly compromised you know, he was coming back from injury. He said that it wasn't bothering him, but like even his manager was acknowledging that the shoulder was a problem. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of ways to kind of show up for your team. And one of them is to be the only guy <laughs> who can, you know, other than Lance Lynn, who got beat just as bad, right? Like this, this was a, 
this was a Dodgers team that just didn't have starting pitching. They were so compromised by injury and obviously Arias's um, administrative leave. So, you know, they didn't really have a choice but to put Kershaw out there. And he doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who's going to say, no, I, I can't go unless he really can't. Um, but I, I, he's a Hall of Famer. I mean, like he's a, a no doubt Hall of Famer to my mind. I think that People who know the Hall of Fame better than I do agree. So I feel more confident in my um, prognostication there. But, you know, he's he's such an interesting figure in baseball history because, you know, he's one of the first guys where we had his entire career basically in the pitch tracking era. So we know so much more about Clayton Kershaw and what he has done in the course of his career than you know, even some of the great pitchers from, you know, prior generations. So I think that, you know, being able to appreciate everything that he has done, um, we're going to be able to add so much, you know, texture to that resume when it comes time to evaluate his Hall of Fame case. I do wish that for his sake, he he had a ring that, that wasn't the pandemic year, um, you know, I think that playing baseball at all in 2020 was impossibly hard. And so to me, like that, that championship is not tarnished by virtue of coming at the end of a very short season. But I know that there are going to be people who say, well, his only ring came after a 60 game season and, you know, the weird bubble postseason that we candidly probably shouldn't (laughs) have been playing, but, you know, we decided to anyway. So, um, I think that that will be something that is a knock against him, but you look at awards, you look at um, just the, the statistical resume, what he has meant to that franchise. Like he's a hall of famer. He has struggled at times in the postseason, And I think that that is, you know, context that we will have to kind of grapple with, but it's not going to keep him from being a first ballot guy in my mind. So everyone can just relax. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone too. Um, we have a question from Susan that I'm going to rephrase a little bit, but um, what impact does Oakland tanking have on the sport? I think that the Oakland situation is so embarrassing for baseball. Um, you know, it is the situation with that ballpark is not for lack of enthusiasm on the part of that fan base. Um, you know, they are not always there, um, but they are not always there because the the product that the owner of that team is trying to put on the field is fairly major league caliber. I always feel bad for the players who end up on teams like this because, you know, it's not their fault that this is the situation that they're in. But, um, you know, that that franchise has such a storied tradition. It it holds such an important place in baseball's history. Like you, you think of the guys who have gone through and worn an Oakland A's uniform for this to be kind of the end that it meets in the Bay, I think is just a profound failure on the part of their owner and the league. Um, I think that it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting test case when we think about what municipalities are going to be willing to spend and bear to keep teams local um, you know, I think that it's perfectly appropriate for the people of Oakland to say we can spend the money that we would allocate to a, a ballpark better. And they were willing to meet John Fisher part of the way. They just didn't want to pay for him to have like a real estate empire on the side of the ballpark. <laughs> so right. I, you know, I think that, um, unfortunately it is sort of a microcosm of a lot of the things that are causing competitive issues within the sport where you have an owner who isn't particularly interested in the quality of the major league product. He's not willing to invest very much uh, in terms of payroll. He's not willing to just finance front to back a ballpark. And so, you know, he's looking for another city to sort of put that bill on and I guess Mm -hmm. was able to find it in Vegas. But, um, you know, when, when clubs have other avenues of generating money that are separate from the quality of the play on the field, like building a ballpark that also has a real estate development adjacent to it, we get 
in this dangerous place where we're sort of decoupling revenue from the actual baseball. And when that happens and teams can still make money, despite the fact that they're, you know, putting a, a team on the field that at one point looked like it was going to sort of shatter our understanding of how many games, a uh, you know, a big league team could lose. You're, you're in an untenable situation and it, it doesn't just tarnish the experience of the A's. You know, when you have clubs that are losing hundred plus win, 100 plus games a year, you kind of have to look at the clubs that are winning more than 100 games and ask yourself, how meaningful are these, you know, win totals that they're putting up? And, you know, a lot of the teams that won big this year are really good. Like, I don't think anyone's concerned that the Atlanta Braves are not a quality club, but, you know, it it dampers the competitive feel for everyone. And then you, you know, you kind of have to wonder, like, that really a hundred win team or is it a hundred win team that plays in a division that has, you know, a hundred plus team, how does that impact our understanding of its quality? So um, I, I think it really sucks. And I just feel so bad for the fans there because, you know, like I said, there's, there's enthusiasm for baseball in the Bay and there's enthusiasm for baseball in Oakland and all of the emotional and monetary investment that they made was not returned. And that's, you know, that's something that the sport should view as a failing um, on its part, so. MLB made an effort to directly connect this year's rule changes with the increase in attendance. To what degree, if any, do you think that's the case? I think it's definitely in the soup, right? Um, I think that part of what we, we're experiencing this year was sort of continued and steady improvement from the pandemic. You know, I think it did take a while for people to feel comfortable going back to the ballpark. I think that the owner's lockout left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. So um, being removed from that labor strife, I think had an impact. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, some of it was that, games were just manageable for people to go to you know if you work if you have kids and all of a sudden the game that starts at seven is reliably getting out at 9 30 instead of 10 or 10 30 or 11 you know that makes a big difference in terms of your ability to kind of go to the park and see stuff um and i do think that you know part of it too was that we we have a lot of really exciting young players in the game right now um and i don't know if that gets enough credit for driving interest in the sport you know, when you have not just young guys who are really good, but young guys who are like charismatic and interesting and, you know, playing at such a high level and are actually getting to the big leagues when they seem to be ready rather than being held down so that their teams can get another year of service. Like all of those things combined, I think makes a big difference in people wanting to engage with the sport because it feels, it feels like it's about the baseball and not about all of the and not about major league baseball, if that distinction makes sense. You know, we get so caught up in the um, sort of, you know, the Rob Manfred of it all. <laughs> As, when you're away from that and focused on the field, I think it has a lot to recommend it. So um, I think that makes a big difference too. Um, our next question is from Jonathan. Can you compare what it's like to work for a place like Fangraphs versus working for a team or other places in the industry? Um, well, I can't speak to the team piece, although if you think fans are stressed in October, you should talk to folks who work for clubs because boy, do they barely sleep at all during, during the postseason, <laughs> um, provided their club is in the postseason. If it isn't, then they're just trying to plan for next year. But, um, uh, you know, we we're trying to accomplish fundamentally different things. I mean, I think that we are going through some of the same avenues to get there, but you know, when you're, when you're working for a team in theory, like the thing you're trying to do is help your team win as much as possible. And when you're writing for fan graphs, we're trying to produce, you know, pieces that our readers are going to find interesting and hopefully, you know, sort of illuminate something about the game that they might not have known. But, um, you know, we're, we're also at sort of a journalistic remove from the team side. And that means that sometimes we have to talk about stuff that isn't great that's going on in the game, you know, whether it's labor or the way that the league is trying to address domestic violence or, you know, the future of the television landscape, just to pick a couple, 
know, obviously different <laughs> uh, weights apply to each of those things. But um, so, you know, we have to be really clear eyed about what the future of baseball looks like and try to engage with it honestly and help our readers understand sort of the broader forces within the industry that are determining, you know, what baseball you're able to watch every night on TV and who's able to play the game and afford to play the game and wants to play the game and, you know, who is being included or excluded in terms of like the front office makeup. So I think that we have a, um, you know, we have a different relationship to it. Um, and then I think compared to other publications, you know, because our sort of uh, focus is analytics, um, we, we occupy this like little corner of the internet, right? Where um, some of the, of the concepts that we are able to assume our readers are familiar with you know, would have to be spelled out in, in pretty exacting detail if they were going to appear in The Athletic or Wall Street Journal or, you know, maybe even Sports Illustrated. So, you know, when we bring new writers onto the site, one of the ways that I put it is like, you don't have to spell out what wins above replacement means at Fangraphs. But if you were writing for The Athletic, you might have to say wins above replacement, war, and then you could use war <laughs> after that, right? Where we're not you know, we're, we don't have to do that. So I think that, um, you know, helping to, um, we still want to help people understand new analytics concepts that, you know, might be impacting the way that teams are constructing their rosters or thinking about um, who is good and who isn't. Um, but there is sort of a, a sabermetric fluency that we're able to assume that um, I imagine if I were to go somewhere else would take some getting used to like, oh, right, I have to, I have to tell people what WRC plus is. They don't necessarily know that, which is fine. Like, I think, you know, there are a lot of ways to engage with the sport and it doesn't have to be in advanced metrics. So um, that's okay. But, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to add those notes when I'm editing a piece of <laughs> so. uh, <laughs> um, Here's another one from Scott. If Rob Manfred called you tomorrow and asked for one, just one recommendation oh to improve the product on the field, what would you say to him? That's an excellent question, Scott. That is a great question. The product on the field. Can can I can I cheat and give like a very specific small thing and then a broader thing? Absolutely. I'm answering for you. So Scott. um they they have they have to get rid of the zombie runner in extra innings. I can't stand the zombie runner in extra innings. It is it is offensive to me that there is a guy on second in extras during the regular season. And I, you know, I'm sympathetic to the fact that it sounds like the players actually want the zombie runner. And ultimately, like they're the ones that have to go out there and be exhausted at the end of a baseball game. So their opinion probably should matter more than mine in this particular, but it is, it's just not, it's not right. It's not right. You know, this is a place where I am, I think a traditionalist, like I want, I want there to be, you know, the tension of extra innings. And I think that when you look at how many games were really going super long, you know, really deep into a game where you're depleting your whole bullpen, you're having to call guys up from AAA to fill in innings the next day, it wasn't that many. So I think that we should take the wonderful time savings that we have gotten with the pace of play improvements and they should give us the zombie runner back because that sounds like a good idea to me. Um, I think more generally, like, you know, the sport, for the sport to have long-term health, I think that the league really needs to grapple with how inaccessible baseball, particularly travel ball is for mm -hmm. um, most kids who play it. And it, you know, even for families who can afford travel ball, it takes over their entire lives. Like I have family friends whose kids are trying to play and you know i want to say like is are they really good like is this actually you, they can just play little league and like have fun they don't have to do this whole rigmarole but it's it's incredible the difference that it makes in terms of who can play and be in front of scouts and be sort of on that trajectory to maybe play pro ball and i think mm -hmm. that you know if we want the sport to look like America does but also you know I think one of the 
one of the primary ways. It's not certainly not the only way because I didn't play baseball, but you know, getting kids to play when they're little, I think does sort of cement the sport as a thing that's interesting to them as they mature. And so I think both in terms of, you know, attracting younger fans to the sport, but also, you know, having it not just be something that incredibly wealthy families have access to, the league needs to continue to really work on getting, you know, travel ball to be accessible for folks. I think they are doing actually good work in this space, but it's just, there needs to be more. There needs to be more and more and more. You can't just have one, you know, series a year where they bring folks in and, you know, are able to um, get seen by scouts. You have to, you have to open it up because even, you know, when you look at some of the recent draft classes um, where there has actually been greater racial diversity at the top of the classes, a lot of those kids are coming from, you know, their parents are pro athletes, you know, their dad was a pro athlete. And so it, it is important, but it, it's not, um, you know, it's still not accessible to families that aren't coming from that socioeconomic, uh, class. So I think that there's a lot of work still to do there to make it more accessible across the board. Cause you know, if it's just rich kids who can play, that's, that's a problem. That's a real problem. And, it, and I think that if they view it as an existential threat to the sport, rather than just a, an inconvenient thing that people are like, Hey, it would be nice if we had, you know, greater access to this, that it, it would be an important sort of change of focus for them. So that's the, that's the more serious answer than just the zombie. Runner. <laughs> Although I am right about the zombie runner. <laughs> Uh, Mike is asking lots of chatter around restructuring the divisions and leagues. Do you have any perspective on what that might look like and the reasoning? So I think that what they, when there's talk of this, what they're trying to do is address sort of, and I don't want to pick on the central divisions, but the central division issue, right? Where particularly in the American league, you know, they just, they haven't been particularly competitive but you still get, you know, a division champion who has access to the postseason. Now, the league is sort of losing the argument here because they expanded the postseason. So if they really cared about keeping, you know, the 84 win Diamondbacks out of the playoffs, you know, they might have structured things a little bit differently. But I think that, you know, there has been talk. I don't really anticipate that this will be the direction they go, but that there has been talk of sort of saying, OK, we have the AL field and the NL field. And rather than having division winners, it's, you know, the best um, six teams from each. But I think that what we are more likely to see um, is to reseed the playoff field after each round so that you're guaranteeing um, that, you know, there isn't an imbalance where a, a good team um is faced with a really strong wild card because, you know, the AL East is so good and you have all of these teams that would be division winners if it were, if they were in a different division in as wild cards who are then facing really, you know, strong teams and those strong teams feel like it's, it's not quite fair. Now, all of the AL East teams ended up getting eliminated from the postseason (laughs) before the world series this year anyway. So, you know, you, you can never predict October, but I think that, um, the reseeding part of it makes a lot of sense to me to try to balance things and to, to continue to offer incentive to teams to be good enough to win their divisions, get a first round five and, and go in, you know, as the one or two seed within, uh, within their uh, league. Cause you know, we want teams to, to feel like yeah. there's folks coming up behind them and they have to improve in order to, to do well. So um, I don't want to reduce any of the incentives there. And I think that, you know, reseeding doesn't change the calculus there very much, but it does sort of offer an additional concession to the teams that make it through to the the division series automatically. So, um, but I think, I don't know. I think that owners like divisions and candidly, I think fans like the divisions. Like I think having a division rival and really being able to invest, you know, mm-hmm. your um, your feelings as a fan into like, you know, we hate the Astros or whoever it is, right? Like, I think that that makes a big difference in terms of how fans engage with the sport. They 
you know, if you're a Yankees fan, can you imagine if the Red Sox weren't in your division, you wouldn't know what to do with yourself. So I think it's, I think it's good for the sport to have that kind of, you know, hopefully not too intense, but you know, background animosity. It, it, yeah, it, yeah. it breeds investment. <laughs> I think the negativity brings life to the sport as, it, yeah. <laughs> as long as it's good negativity, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not, not taking it too far. Um, Let's see. Gary is asking, there have been several high profile domestic problems recently. What impact do you think domestic issues will have on MLB? So I think that, um, I mean, gosh, dealing with sort of domestic violence, and unfortunately, there have been some child abuse issues, too, in the last couple of years. But um, I think that there there are sort of two constituencies and they are kind of hard to satisfy at the same time. So there's the effect that seeing athletes who you admire, who are being well compensated by clubs you care about um, enact violence on their loved ones that I think particularly for women and non, non-binary folks can make them feel at a remove from the sport. Um, and so I think the, the having that taken seriously on the part of major league baseball and the clubs is really important for our understanding of how we fit in to the sport and the place that we have there. Um, I think that a tension that exists is that, you know, the, the group of people who really need to be at the center of any policy are the people who are victims of domestic violence at the hands of these players. And that can be a complicated question, right? Like domestic violence experts will tell you a zero tolerance policy actually reduces the likelihood that people will report because if your husband or boyfriend or partner is going to lose his job and his livelihood, that might be, you know, financially untenable for you. It might be dangerous for you. You know, it might incite further violence. And so, you know, I think that there's an understandable desire on the part of a lot of fans to just say, get these guys out of here. Like, we don't want to ever see them again. And I, I, on an emotional level, understand that instinct, but it can kind of sit in tension with what we maybe need to be doing to provide support to the folks who are victims here. And hopefully some kind of intervention that can give these guys healthier safer conflict resolution skills because you know the thing I worry about is it gets all these headlines and you know we have a a reaction to it and then more often than not because of the way our legal system works these guys go home and then like what do what do what do they do you know what do their girlfriends and wives do what do their kids do and it's it is kind of fundamentally weird that this is falling to an employer to litigate and sort out, right? So it's a it's a complicated thing. I do think that the league um, is trying to find the right balance. I do think that they could put some structural stuff in place to reduce the incentives that teams have to still acquire these guys. You know, if you... Um, you know, you got to make these guys postseason ineligible. You got to make sure that, you know, there isn't incentive to trade for them if their suspensions are over prior to postseason play. So, you know, I don't want some, you know, NBA in a front office to look at like the the worst, darkest moments of a person's life and be like, oh, there's a competitive edge to be found there. Like, that's gross. So, Um, I think it does impact the way that people engage with the sport. I don't think that, you know, the problem is unique to baseball. I don't think that there's something about baseball inherently that sort of um, makes this a more likely problem. It's unfortunately a likely problem just in society generally. So, of course, you're going to see that replicated in this space. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, I think part of why we've seen it be a high profile story is that there is actually a process in place for reporting and discipline, which wasn't always true in the sports history. Um, and it's not as if, you know, unfortunately it's not as if players weren't engaging in that behavior prior to there being a collectively bargained 
policy for discipline. We just didn't hear about it as much or we heard about it years after the fact. Um, so I don't know. I think that having a candid conversation about it is useful if for no other reason than there's still this persistent view within our society broadly that this is a problem that shouldn't get talked about and that some of these women shouldn't be believed. And, you know, I think that it, it does afford an opportunity for fans to examine that belief, but I wish that it weren't, you know, the results of these circumstances. It's really terrible. So, yeah. Thank you for answering that in such a thoughtful <laughs> manner. Honestly, um, a lot of people would kind of sidestep that a little bit. I really appreciate you answering that that way. Um, okay. For our last question, we are going to shift gears into something that looks to be fun. Um, okay. Love fun. Jonathan, we're going to end on a fun note. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> you considered a lot of crazy hypotheticals on your podcast. Do oh. you have a favorite and or any that you think oh. could actually be a good idea? Oh, gosh. There are so, you know, our listeners are unhinged in the best possible way. Um, the number of emails that we get that start, I'm going to admit I'm a little stoned right now, are very funny. I'm like, <laughs> you know, some of these hypotheticals, I think you would have, you would have to be to come up with them. Um, we've had people who have wanted to put trampolines on the field. We had, um, we had someone who wondered, you know, if an outfielder had an extra arm coming out of their head, would that be advantageous to them? Would it be legal for them to play because they have a third arm? Would that present a competitive advantage the league would try to dissuade? I'm trying to think of any that are like um, actually reasonable uh, to implement. Some of them, they're all so far out there that I don't know that they're ready. <laughs> I would really recommend, but there have been a lot of very silly um, rule changes proposed to the Effectively Wild podcast. And I do wish that we could kind of have one like zany competition weekend where we tried all of them out. Some of them are, are just obviously not safe. Like you can't put trampolines on the field. And w one guy wanted to have a have the pitcher's mound slowly descending throughout the course of the game just like getting lower and lower into the field until like I the guy couldn't see over it. um you know they want to be able to run the bases backward I I think that they are meant to be um ridiculous to the point of not being something that the league could ever implement but um I do like the the folks who want to bring back Tall's Hill in Houston so not the flagpole. The flagpole seemed dangerous, but I do wish that we were willing to get a little a little zanier with some of the ballpark configurations because we haven't had a really a really wonky one in a while. Once they took the hill out, it was all downhill from there. Uh, oh no! <laughs> um, Sorry, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. <laughs> we are going to wrap up. Thank you so much, so so much for doing this. Um, I like honestly great time chatting with you i hope that thank everyone so much. watching got to enjoy that as well um everyone thank you for joining us thank you again meg martin i see your question i promise you if you tweet meg she will answer that um <laughs> <laughs> um thank you everyone have a good night thanks everyone <laughs>